But of course, the most important phase of his uh, work in Germany was going to the Bauhaus. The Bauhaus opened in 1919 as a utopian school that was founded by Walter Gropius and others. Um, many of you may have been to see the Bauhaus show at MoMA recently. If not, I refer you to the catalog and immense literature on the Bauhaus, but it's a very good catalog uh, to start with. Um, he went there as a student. He enrolled in uh, the summer of 1920. Uh, but he was 32 years old. In other words, he was as old as most of the teachers in the school. He was one year older than the teacher who taught the, the preliminary course. Um, so anyway, since it was clear that uh, he, he joined because he wanted to be part of this utopian vision of making art, architecture, design part of a whole and part of the means of making our world and therefore our lives a better place. Um, since he had already considerable skill, he was asked to uh, assist in the teaching of some courses, and then he was asked to take over the and run the glass workshop. The Bauhaus was set up on the principle that everybody had to take the preliminary course, in German called Vorkurs. But the preliminary course was mandatory, and that was what focused on the basics. It was started by one of the visionaries' founders, uh, Johannes Itten, uh, a painter with uh, wonderfully uh, Eastern ideas. He made the students do yoga exercises in class and things like that. Um, when Itten left in 1923, two things, two teachers came in and changed that course dramatically. Laszlo Moholy a Hungarian constructivist, uh, really quite a vanguard innovator in, in avant-garde, in abstract uh, geometric art and in ideas about applying art to life. He came and Joseph Albers was promoted to master. They didn't call them professors, they called them masters. So Albers and Moholy Naj shared the teaching of the preliminary course from 1923 until the school closed in 1933, so for a decade. And Albers, in this way, he had absorbed Itten's theories of color, uh, which had a fair amount to do with theosophy and spiritualist ideas, which fit in with Vasily Kandinsky, who was one of the main teaching masters at the Bauhaus, uh, and Paul Clay, the other main teaching master. Um, on the screen, you see here, this is a, one of a series of prints that Kandinsky made while at the Bauhaus in 1922 when he was starting to adapt the more expressive and open-formed uh, compositions of his, his uh, paintings from 1908 uh, to about 1918, and starting to make them more regularized. He was becoming influenced by some of the uh, more scientific, mathematical, and mass production-oriented ideas that were at the core of the Bauhaus. Over on the right is a Paul Clay of a similar period, just to show you the kind of thing they were doing. Um, what we have in our collection, uh, which is extremely rare, are some of the works that Albers made while he was the master of the Glass Bauhaus, the uh, Glass Workshop at the Bauhaus. Many of these did not survive because you couldn't fit all of them into a couple of steamer trunks. So what we have are about a fourth of all the ones he sold. The Metropolitan, for example, has two. MoMA, for example, has one. We have four. Plus, we have the studies for other glass works, some of which survive as glass, some of which do not. The one on the upper left is called Window Picture. And this was made during the period uh, after World War I when Germany went into extreme re uh, recession and extreme hyperinflation, you know, where it took a million Deutschmark to buy a loaf of bread. That's, I mean, that, was, that brought down the entire middle class and essentially brought down the country and its government. Well, during that period, um, the philosophy at the Bauhaus was you can make art from anything and anything can be made into art. So Albers did his bit of that by going to the Weimar city dump and finding things that he could use to make his quote-unquote stained glass windows. He had prior experience with the reparation and, and making of stained glass. What he was trying to do was upgrade it for the modern industrial and mass production era. Well, this is not mass production, surely. It's very, very handmade. You can see where he's tied the elements together with thin little copper wires. 
But what he did is he went and found as many colored glass things as he could, especially bottles <laughs> and jars, Break, broke them up into pieces that he could use, especially the bottoms, which are thicker and can uh, create different refraction of light. And that's basically what you have here, bottle, 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 so forth, all the circular ones. Um, he also took metal sheets and little scraps of metal and punched holes in them with different shapes. So you can see that they're kind of triangular, they go up a bit. See there's a red X in that one, there's green squares in that one, there's a yellow zigzag in that one. The idea was is he's creating all these patterns. However, the only way you can appreciate these patterns and the luminosity of the colored glass is if they are illuminated. And indeed, that's how these would be seen. He called them window pictures because that was precisely it. He stood them or suspended them in front of windows so the daylight shone through them. Um, we showed this once, like that, uh, in 2005, I think, in the fall. We are now going to show three of ours backlit, along with four from the Alvarez Foundation, which they very kindly lent us. So we will have a row of seven backlit windows from the Bauhaus period, progressing from these found object ones to the more um, controlled and uh, abstract and better materials. The one on the right, for example, is uh, one of the ones being lent to us by the foundation. And you can see right away, he's, he's, made, he's made a quick leap from a square composition that has a kind of uh, uh, irregular composition, in this one on the left, to a similarly square composition, but now very structured. What he did was, he started making an actual framework which he would for traditional stained glass. So each of the grids here is actually an iron framework. He used to call them his lattice work. And inside are pieces of uh, broken glass trimmed to be squares and tied in place by copper wires. So you can see uh, a very strong urge to regularity as well as to economy of form. Just to give you an idea of the context for this, um, this is a building that only existed briefly. It was by a visionary architect, token architect named Bruno Tau. He and several of his colleagues believed that um, architecture should be more spiritual. It should enclose us in our houses and uh, workplaces with suggestions of the beyond, of the spirituality of our nature and the universe. And for that, glass was deemed a particularly appropriate metal for the same reason that glass is used in churches. Stained glass windows help create a certain ambience. So this is one of Bruno Tau's proposals. All of that kind of beehive roof is made out of different colored glass. Um, Albers was not so drawn to that spiritual aspect, but it was right at this moment between about 1914 and 1922 that this use of glass as colored glass, as a spiritual medium in the practical arts, uh, was very widespread in Germany. On the upper right is the largest commission for a stained glass window that Joseph Albers ever made. This is a black and white photograph of the windows. You can see that they're vertical panels, juxtaposed, uh, that he made for a house designed by Gropius just outside Berlin in 1920-21. The house was destroyed later, so we don't have any color images of these, but you can see that he's uh, you know, in 1921, he's making our window picture for broken bottles from the dump and making that grid picture. And what he's doing here is bringing together some of the irregularity uh, and dynamism of the one with the structure and regularity of the other. And you can see how he sort of paces out things like here we've got a form on a diagonal grid up above, a grid there, a grid there, a grid there, a grid there. In other words, he anchors each of the vertical panels with a strong, uh, regular grid, and that, that seems to have allowed him to uh, be a little more irregular and asymmetrical of the rest of the composition.